<laughs> oh, okay, great. So you've been watching me stand here. Well, welcome to Wednesday night Bible study at Gospel Grace Egg Harbor Township. I'm Dave Off, one of the pastors here at Gospel Grace. We're glad you're joining us tonight, be it online or sitting here. So uh, we're going to have a fun time. So uh, well, let's get to it. I'm going to read something first, and then we'll, we'll just do what we do. So see how it goes. Um, last time I had a Wednesday night service, I talked about John the 8th chapter. And I'm sure all of us remember everything about it. I don't. I don't actually. So, um, But what happened was, normally I don't prepare ahead of time. But one thing, I felt the Spirit telling me to go back and read what happened before that. So immediately, in my complex brain, I already came up with an awesome title. And it was called The Chapter Before. Well, I didn't get to use it because it went a different direction, but I, I wanted to read through John, the seventh chapter, uh, leading up to Jesus talking about um, who he is and then not recognizing him as God. And then the eighth chapter, of course, they go on to talk about the difference between the Abrahamic covenant and the covenant of Moses. So um, the seventh chapter is mainly dealing with who Jesus is and who, who people thought of him, who, what they thought of Jesus as the Messiah. So um, it starts out where they're being called up to, called up to the feast, Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, he's hanging out in Galilee with his family, and his brothers say, hey, it's time to go. No, we're heading up. Let's go. And I think it was almost a thing of them saying, like, You've, it's time for you to show yourself, show who you are. Um, and Jesus says, my time is not yet. You all go ahead. I'm going to hang out here for a while. And he didn't want to go up with fanfare. It was really what it was. He wanted to sort of go in on the down low, kind of hang out for a while, and then he's going to get to it. So um, the Jews are looking for him, and it's mainly the Jews from Jerusalem were the ones that are really looking for him um, to find out what he was. And, of course, they also were upset with some of the teachings that Jesus had. So partway through the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stands up and he teaches. And all the Pharisees are looking around like, who is this guy? Now, I know Jason's talked a lot about this, and it's been really cool about like the schools of prophets that they had back then, how they, the young Jewish men would be raised up, and they'd go through this whole schooling. But Jesus didn't. He actually didn't go to one of those schools. He wasn't raised up in the, like, that kind of manner where he should know how to discern the things of the law. But Jesus is, of course, teaching from what his father says. That's what they talk about here in John, the seventh chapter. He says he's speaking to things of the Father. And uh, he also says that I'm going about not seeking my own glory, but I'm seeking the glory for the Father. And I think it's the same way that in our lives that we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Just like if you're an ambassador in another nation, you're representing the United States in that nation. And it's the same thing Jesus was talking about. He's basically saying all I'm doing is representing this higher power. I'm bringing that part over here so you can see a bit of that. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's reflecting the glory back to God the Father. Um, we're just going to jump in at verse 20, the first scripture. Oh, this is really small. I apologize. It looks so much bigger on my laptop, so my bad. Let's see if I can get my laptop on here, too, because I want to read along on here so I can actually see it. <laughs> I'm going to read the Passion Translation because it's a little bit easier. Um, it flows a little bit better. It says, Then some of the crowd shouted out, You must be out of your mind. Who's trying to kill you? And Jesus has said, basically, why are, why are, you, trying, why are you going about trying to kill me? And the, the, I think King James actually says, um, You have a devil. <laughs> it's like the ultimate insult. Oh, you have a devil? I'll, I'll read it in there. Yeah. He says, Thou has a de- has the devil. Who goes about to kill you? He says, You must be out of your mind. Who's trying to kill you? Jesus replied, I've only done one miracle. And you all marvel. Yet isn't it true that Moses and your forefathers ordered you to circumcise your son if the eighth day fell on the Sabbath? So you cut away the part of the man on a Sabbath that doesn't break the Jewish law. Then why would you be so indigent, indignant, indignant, I got it. I should should be reading King James. Uh, for me, for making this man completely healed on the Sabbath. Stop judging based on the superficial. First, you must embrace the standards of mercy and truth. Now, what Jesus had done there is he had healed the lame man at the pool of Bethsaida. Was it pool of Bethsaida? Shalom? 
Bula Shalom. And what he had done there is the guy's waiting for the water to be troubled. Jesus walks up and asks him what's going on. He says, I'm waiting for the water to be troubled, and I'm trying to get in. But every time the water's troubled, I try to get in. Somebody jumps in before me, and I don't get in. And Jesus, but Jesus heals him with, without, see, I don't, I don't get this. Because we talked about this before in Wednesday nights. He did not actually do any work. See, the law, in order for the law to be broken, Jesus had to do a work. He had, he had to physically, physically do work. That's what the law was. You couldn't physically do work. And Jesus, he just spoke a word and said, you're whole. You're be every whit whole is what King James says, completely whole. Completely whole. Not just healed of your infirmity, but completely whole. So he actually didn't do any work, so I don't know what they're upset about, but to them I think it was the, the idea that in order for somebody to be healed, they had to do something for it. And Jesus is actually bringing about the opposite truth there. So I think that's interesting because that's, that's actually what he is basically being accused of here. And uh, we'll go down and read the next part there. It says, then some of the residents of Jerusalem spoke up and says, isn't this the one they're trying to kill? <laughs> they just said they weren't trying to kill him. And now here comes the next group of guys. Wait a minute. Yeah, hey, that's the guy they're trying to kill. <laughs> it's kind of obvious, right? They really didn't like Jesus. They really didn't like him. So why is he here speaking publicly and not one of the Jewish leaders is doing anything about it? Are they starting to think that he's the anointed one? But how could he be since we know this man is from Galilee, and no, but no one will know where the true Messiah comes from. He'll just appear out of nowhere. So I did a little research on this because this kind of baffled me a little bit because it said like, they said the Messiah would just appear. And there's a, smite, a slight reference to it in Isaiah 53, um, but there, there is no real reason that they think the Messiah would just appear. It was something, it was almost like a tradition that came along. And that's what they, they basically believed in, that the Messiah would just appear. Now, at his second coming, his glorious coming, he actually is just going to appear. But in this case, they were saying, first of all, wait, he's from Galilee, but not realizing he was actually born in Bethlehem because the Messiah had to come from Bethlehem. So it was just a little side note there. It was kind of interesting to see that, and that's the only reason I pointed it out in the Scripture there. But I just thought that was interesting, just showing who he is. Now I'm going to jump down to the lower part of the chapter. Because he goes through this whole thing, and then later in the feast, he stands up again. And it says, when the crowd heard Jesus' word, um, he actually says, he stands up and he says uh, about being, the, I'm going to read it here, because otherwise I'll mess it up. Uh, he talks about being um, the fountain. He says, any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. This is verse 37, 38. And it says, he that believeth on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly shall fill living waters. Right? Rivers of living water. So when the crowd hears that, then they say, the crowd heard Jesus' word, and some of them said, this is up on the board here now. This man is really a prophet. Others said, he is the Messiah. Others said, how could he be the anointed one since he's from Galilee? Same thing. They're wondering where he came from. Don't the scriptures say that he'll be one of David's descendants and will be born in Bethlehem, the city of David? See, I actually was trying to do some research on this and figure it out. <laughs> and I did. I looked for a couple hours. <laughs> and then I realized if I just read on, <laughs> it actually told you why they thought he was coming from the wrong place in the next scripture there. He says that he should have come from Bethlehem, the city of David. So the crowd was divided over Jesus. Now, get the whole point here is they, they're trying to judge who Jesus is. A lot of these people either knew him, they knew of him, they knew of some of his miracles that he did, they, they knew some of the things about him. They've heard him teach, but they're trying to figure out, is this the right person or not? So they have to have their ear tuned to it. And I was listening to, there's another worship song, which I really would love to play tonight, but it's a little alternative worship kind of thing. But the guy was doing this thing, and he says, when Jesus comes back and the trumpet blows, will you know what the sound is? And, and he actually does this thing with the microphone where he blows it, his voice sounds like a trumpet. I always thought about that. You know, we don't, we don't really think about that as believers. One day we're going to hear a trumpet sound. It's like, are we ready for that? I mean, yeah, God's coming back sometime. That's great. But can you imagine actually hearing a trumpet blow and knowing that's for you? I think that's pretty awesome. So um, let, me, yeah, let me get back to where I was. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so it says the crowd was divided over Jesus. Some wanted to arrest him, but no one dared lay a hand on him. So when the temple guards returned to the Pharisees, now listen, temple guards are sent out to arrest Jesus. And they go up to arrest Jesus and they hear him. It's the same thing that happens in the earlier part that I read in 20 through 27. When, they re, when he is speaking, he has such power when he speaks that people have to stop and listen. So it says, when the temple guards returned to the Pharisees 
and the uh, leading priests without Jesus, they were questioned, where is he? Why didn't you bring the man back with you? And they answered, you don't understand. He speaks amazing things like no one else has ever spoken. Just the power of Jesus. And it says the religious leaders mocked. Oh, so now you've been led astray by him. Do you see even one of us, your leaders, following him? This ignorant rabble swarms around him because none of them know anything about the law. They're all cursed. Just then Nicodemus, who secretly spent time with Jesus, spoke up. For he was respected, of a respected voice among them. And he cautioned them, saying, Does our law decide a man's guilt before first we hear him and allow him to defend himself? And they argued, oh, so now you're his advocate, so now you're an advocate for this Galilean? Search the scriptures, Nicodemus. You'll see that there's no mention of a prophet coming out of Galilee. So that ended their debate, and each man went on their own way. And I like 53 in King James, it says, every man went to their own house. <laughs> they, they don't know what to do with this guy. And I just thought it was so cool because it's so powerful that here is literally officers go to arrest this guy, and they can't even do it because of the power of Jesus' words. So it's all figuring out who Jesus is and also what spirit they're looking at him from. Now, I know the reason you all came out tonight was really because I wrote you a story. Actually, I wrote it for my lovely wife, Sarah. You're welcome. (laughs) I wrote a little story, and I'm going to read it to you because it actually sort of fits in with this, uh, what I'm talking about tonight. And then we'll actually get into the actual sermon part of this thing. And I call this Leroy the Sheep. Okay. Once there was a hired shepherd who had the most perfect flock of sheep. Everything the sheep needed to live and grow and multiply was provided. Every day he kept them in line by reading them a set of rules devised for their well-being. Don't drink too much. Don't eat too much. Don't walk away from the group. Treat the other sheep well. Every day he read to them the same words. And the sheep would try to stretch the rules to see what they could get away with. So the hired shepherd added to the rules to make them more specific. If a sheep broke a rule, he would be looked at with scorn. And with shame and self-resentment, the sheep would try to get back in line. And this went on for many, many years and many, many more rules. One day, Leroy the sheep had his head down. He had found a particularly tasty patch of grass and was mowing through it with reckless abandon. He had done this a time or two before and knew he would end up with an ache in one of his stomachs. He even knew the rule, don't eat too much. He knew the rule was for his own good, but the grass was so tasty. And it just went on and on and on. And so did Leroy. He also knew he was not supposed to wander off. But wow, this grass is good. Then he noticed a change. The sweet, juicy grass was all gone. All around him were rocks and tall hills. And worse, a cold wind was starting to blow. Raindrops were falling. And worse still, it was getting dark. Since this was not his first time wandering off, Leroy thought, well, just maybe I'd find my own way back. Last time, it took a few hours, but eventually he heard the other sheep and found them after going around a few bends. But this time seemed different. The place was strange to him. As he wandered, the daylight faded, and he began to lose all hope. He thought about the things the hired shepherd had said, thinking that perhaps they would help him find his way. But no matter how hard he tried, he just walked further and further away. The hired shepherd counted the sheep that evening and noticed the count was short by one. Oh, well, he said, they know the rules. He shouldn't have wandered off. Since it was Leroy, it probably had something to do with food. I'll just have to try harder with the rest of these sheep. And I'll make Leroy an example about what happens when he don't abide by the rules. He settled in for the night and began to doze when all at once there was someone next to him. A mighty presence of power and glory that seemed to brighten even the dark night. It was the good shepherd. The hired shepherd had heard about him. For many, many years it was said that he would come. 
All the sheep belonged to him, and he loved them completely. It was even said that he would die in defense of the sheep. Where is Leroy? Asked a voice full of concern and compassion. The hired shepherd struggled for a reply. I, I told him he knew better. This wasn't the first time he wandered off. Look, look, I still have 99. I'll go find him, the voice came again. Leroy was absolutely miserable. He had done it again, and this time was worse. It was dark and raining, and he was far, far from home. His white wool was dirty, and it had gotten all kinds of things stuck to it. Now the hired shepherd would have to pull all those things stuck in his coat, and he could just picture that look on his face. Even if he did find his way back, he knew deep inside himself that eventually he would just go off again, and at some point, he would never find his way back home to the flock. He thought he should just give up. Why bother, he thought as he lay down. But what was that? Leroy heard a voice. Was it the bleeding of his friends? Something stirred inside of him. He knew that sound. Deep, deep inside him, he knew it. It wasn't the other sheep. It wasn't the voice that had read to him all those rules over and over again. But something came alive inside him. Leroy popped up and hollered at the top of his lungs, Bah! Bah! The voice came closer. It was so sweet and clear. Bah! Bah! Leroy didn't know what else to do. He just called as loud as he could. And all at once, there he was. The very essence of power and love. The good shepherd. The stories were true. Leroy tried to explain himself. Bah, bah, bah. The good shepherd smiled. It went right through Leroy to the deepest part of him. He could sense the power and love. All the things he had done wrong seemed to fall away as strong arms lifted him from the ground. And Leroy noticed all his dirty wool was cleaner than it had ever been, whiter than white, perfect even. With an almighty surge, the good shepherd began to dance and shout. He embraced Leroy. The love was overwhelming. How could he love me after what I've done? But those thoughts quickly faded, and Leroy found himself on top of shoulders that felt like they could withstand anything. With a feeling of serenity, Leroy felt his, his eyes began to get heavy. He was exhausted, and the rhythm, rhythm of the good shepherd's stride soon sent him off to sleep, and he knew that he was headed home to stay. So that's my story of Leroy the Sheep. But what I want to talk to you about in that is really important. It, and this is a revelation I never got before. And this story is taken from Luke 15 and John 10. And um, let me see. I think, let's do, because I don't want to jump a little bit, I think. If you look at John 10, which I think I have up on the screen. We're going to skip Romans and go to John 10. And it says, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life as a sacrifice for the sheep. But the worker who serves only for wages is not a real shepherd. Because he has no heart for the sheep, he'll run away and abandon them when he sees a wolf coming. Then the wolf mauls the sheep, drags them off, and scatters them. I alone am the good shepherd. I know those whose hearts are mine, for they recognize me and they know me. There's, I know there's a whole lot of references to sheep and the shepherd all those sorts of things, that sheep literally recognize the voice of the shepherd. And, of course, the shepherd being the door, all, all these different references, and they're all wonderful, wonderful references. I don't want to really get into that part tonight. I want to talk mainly about the difference between the two, the two shepherds. And you see that there in John, the 10th chapter. And if you go back to Romans, I want to read you this, too. Uh, wait, I'm going to talk about this first. The hired shepherd, this is what the Spirit showed me anyway, is a, a reference to the law. All the law can do is point out what you've done wrong. I can't help you. So just like the shepherd in my story who says, well, I gave him the rules. He didn't abide by them. He's not going to go out and look for them. He's not going to go find the sheep. That's not his job. All his job is to do is just to point out that you did something wrong. This is what you're supposed to do, and yet you did it wrong. And that's the hired shepherd. 
It says even when the wolf comes there, the wolf comes and the hired shepherd flees. He, he's basically useless in the face of danger. It, there's no use to him at all. The Bible says that the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, right? And once we, once we are Christ, then we're under the good shepherd. We're no longer under the hireling. We're no longer under the bad shepherd, which is what I called the title of this lesson, the bad shepherd. Because everything, if you look at the good shepherd, the good shepherd does everything. The bad shepherd says, don't do this, and if you do it, this is what's going to go wrong. This is all the things that can happen because you did something wrong. So the good shepherd does everything for us. And you see that. Go, go down to that other scripture there in Luke 15. And this is the story of the, uh, the 90 and 9. It says, there was once a shepherd who had 100 lambs. One of his lambs wandered away and was lost. So the shepherd left the 99 lambs out in the open field and searched in the wilderness for the lost lamb. He didn't stop until he finally found it. With exuberant joy, he raised it up and placed it on his shoulders, carrying it back with cheerful delight. Returning home, he called all his friends and neighbors and gathered together, saying, let's have a party. Come celebrate with me for the, with the return of my lost lamb. It wandered away, but I found it, and I brought it home. That's it. Okay. Make sure I got to the end. And in this story, I heard Joseph Prince preach this one time, and I really liked it because in this story, of course, I had it written in my Bible, too, from a long time ago. But in this story, it talks about the good shepherd. The good shepherd goes and finds the one that's lost. But first of all, the sheep doesn't even realize it's lost. Leroy did, but that's not really true. It was just his subconscious, right? But the sheep doesn't even realize it's lost. The good shepherd goes to find him, literally cares about him, goes to find him, looks for him until he finds him, then he picks him up. So from the point where that sheep is stuck, he can't go any farther, doesn't know what else to do, and is stuck, the shepherd takes over, and the sheep literally doesn't even have to walk back. There's no work involved. All it comes to is a place of rest. It's complete rest. The shepherd does everything. The shepherd searches. The shepherd cares. The shepherd searches. The shepherd finds. The shepherd picks up. The shepherd carries the shepherd brings him home rejoicing. God's excited about that. And I think so many times with a church situation, especially if you're under the wrong shepherd, you feel that condemnation, you feel that guilt where God's excited to come pick you up, take you home. He's actually excited. That's why I actually like the Passion Translation there. And it says with cheerful delight. I like that. Exuberant joy, he raised it high on his shoulders, carrying it back with cheerful delight. I thought that really flowed nice. But that's what the good shepherd's going to do. And I had one other scripture, and I just want to point it out because I think it's interesting. Romans, the third chapter, 19th verse. And this is something that God gave me in, in reference to this hired shepherd versus good shepherd. And this is what, I, I never saw this before. This is really powerful as Christians, especially those of us that really are, are grace people. We really want to be everything is grace. It's Jesus Christ and everything else falls in line. But it says in the 19th verse, Now we realize that everything the law says is addressed to them that are under its authority. And King James actually says it different. Thanks, Passion Translation, but we'll read King James. Now we know that whatsoever the law says, saith, sorry, <laughs> it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. So what's the purpose of the law? To make people guilty before God. Right? That's what it says. It says that uh, every mouth may be stopped and all the world will become guilty before God. That's the purpose of the law. That's the purpose of the hired shepherd. He's only there for a time. He's only there to point out what you've done wrong. But then the good shepherd comes. But... As grace people, I never saw this. The first part of that verse is really important. It says, now we know that whatsoever things the law says, it says to them that are under the law. So many times as Christians, you're going to have people say, well, what about, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? <laughs> Did you ever have one of those uh, little get-out-of-jail-free cards from your friendly uh, neighborhood policeman? 
gives you a card, you get pulled over, and you kind of slip it with your license. You kind of just let them peek at it. You know, if you've got a friend who happens to be their boss, <laughs> and they say, oh, yeah, forget about that. And, yeah, and you, weren't, you weren't speeding, you know. That's a ticket for those of us that really want to talk about a grace message. Whatsoever the law says, it says to them that are under the law. And that's not to put people down. If they want to be under the law, it's not to put them down. But what it's to say is the whole purpose of the law is that every mouth will be stopped and everybody will become guilty before God. That's the purpose of the law. Once you realize that, you accept Jesus Christ, you're not under the law anymore. So whatsoever the things the law says, it says to them that are under the law. That's not you. <laughs> I, I thought that was great. I'm going to read it again. Maybe you didn't get it. Let me do it one more time. Now we know that whatsoever thing the law says, it says to them that are under the law. I like that. That's, just, that's all I got. But I want to show you that, that two different points of view. A hired shepherd, he knows how to take care of sheep. He knows he can say this, this, and this, but he's not going to do anything to help. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd, and he does everything. He does everything for you. But go back and read Romans 19th chapter, or uh, third chapter, 19th verse, until you actually get the revelation on that, because it's really, really good. Amen? All right, let's pray. God, thank you for being able to study your word tonight. I pray that you bless us as uh, we take this, and just like a sheep mulling it over, putting it through multiple stomachs, choking it back up because you didn't get it the first time, and chewing on it again, and digesting it again, God, I pray that the scriptures and the understanding of your word and the freedom we have in Christ Jesus would get deep into us. And not only get deep into us, but it would be nourishing and bless us as we uh, digest it. And I thank you for it. God, I pray for those that are sick tonight. I pray that you raise them up. I pray for anybody that's in need, supply their needs. God, I pray for uh, just constantly, God, that we just focus on you. Uh, God, it's been what you've been putting in my mind more than anything. It's just focus on Jesus. Focus, like you said to Joshua, the book of the law will not depart from your mouth. Everything else will fall in line. Just follow Jesus, and everything else is good to go. So, God, we praise you for that. Praise you for your faithfulness and your goodness to us. In Jesus' name we say amen. Amen. Ooh.